Good morning. And I want to make a special addition. Welcome. We know we have several guests with us here this Sabbath, even though it's a weekend, uh, a long weekend. By the way, I always find it funny that they call them long weekends when actually it's a long beginning of the next week. Isn't that right? Because technically, you know, the weekend ends <laughs> this evening. But we refer to these as long weekends, and we want to make a special welcome to uh, the Mathis family, the extended Mathis family who are here. Uh, it's, a, it's a big day, even though I understand it was yesterday. Is that correct? Yesterday? Two days ago. Ah, two days ago. The 29th? The 29th. Okay. It was the 29th when... Uh, Sarah celebrated the big 9-0, and we're here today with a special fellowship meal following us, and I'm going to invite all of you, in case you haven't heard it already, join us for that special meal. Normally, we have a fellowship meal the first of the month. This time, we've moved it, because the first is, you know, it's just kind of a few hours away, so we moved it just for this special event. We realize many of our members are not here this Sabbath because they are out. Uh, it's the long weekend. Some of them are up climbing mountains and having other kinds of fun this weekend. But we're glad that we have a relatively full community here. Our church is full because we have welcomed uh, those guests. Now, there are other guests as well. If you're not part of the Mathis family but you're visiting anyway today, please feel free to join our first of the month fellowship meal, which is today. We're glad you're here. This is we're classifying as the first of the month fellowship. We're so thankful you joined us. By the way, there were several things that happened this week besides uh, Sarah's birthday, the 90th birthday on the 29th. I was told, I believe it was the same day that we had uh, Keith Merklin's birthday. I won't tell you his age, but uh, he's around there too. And then uh, the day before, Gary Ojala's birthday, the same day with Richard Worley, which was the 28th. And, and I'll mention something about the 28th in a minute, but it was quite a busy week. It looked like those, what we call our seasoned citizens, were celebrating. We're celebrating a special time this week. Four birthdays that I'm aware of. They may, there may be more, but I want to take you on a quick tour of this week uh, as we can turn the lights down a little bit there. Thanks, gentlemen, for your assistance. By the way, the folk up in the booth and those who take care of the AV, they are really good. You don't notice them. They're doing such a great job. Except if once a year you hear a squeak, then they're like, can't they do their job? Well, folks, they are, they are such a blessing. So thanks to our team up there. They keep things running so well. And I want to just praise the Lord for our young people who are involved. So thanks, guys and girls. <clears throat> All right. The uh, room fire. You've heard of that. The news almost every day. Uh, this is around uh, Yosemite, I believe it is. And they've been really worried about that fire. That's the kind of current news that's happening around us. Of course, Syria, you know what's happening there. If you've kept up with the news even a little bit, uh, there's the possibility that uh, the United States may, I, I think I've got the right word here, go it alone in a battle uh, uh, to, uh, uh, what's the best word? I'm not sure of the language. I'm not into politics, but because of the <coughs> issue of uh, the use of chemical weapons, which they believe that has been by the leader of the country against its own people, the, the Syrians in a mass protest in the capital uh, against uh, the possibility of a strike, probably by the United States. And of course, as you well know, this was a big uh, weekend, uh, or big week, for the commemoration, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, the speech by that not even 35-year-old man. I didn't realize it for some reason until this week that Martin Luther King was 34 years of age when he made that I Have a Dream speech. I thought, what? I went back and checked. I said, did I read this correctly? Sure enough. He was 34 years of age, uh, assassinated before he even reached the age of 40. This was this week in Washington, and of course taking us back to that uh, time way back uh, 50 years ago. And as many of you know, he was actually a pastor, a preacher. They referred to him as the Reverend Martin Luther King, but also as Dr. Martin Luther King. And so that I Have a Dream speech uh, was also there. And if you, if you ever listen to the speech, which I have done, you'll notice this speech is cleverly interlaced, saturated, if you will, with biblical language. He, he's a very, he was a very persuasive preacher. And of course, that takes us to our topic, since we are here in church, fast forward. When we think fast forward, we think of these electronic gadgets, especially on CDs or DVDs and things. You want to go fast forward, uh, you know, back in the 
yesteryear, if we wanted to move to the next song, we had to pick up, anybody remember? Pick up the head carefully, don't scratch the LP. You know what an LP is? <coughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <coughs> don't scratch the LP. Uh, ask your parents or your grandparents, kids, when you get home. <laughs> what does don't scratch the LP means? And we used to fast forward manually, <coughs> lifting that head up and trying to put on the next song. What is fast forward all about? When we think theologically, when we think biblically, we think of the scripture. In the Bible, over and over again, Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 12, for example, uh, Jeremiah says, when, we, when the people fast, I, the Lord says, will hear. Interesting. Whenever the word fast is used in the biblical context, it's connected with what? <clears throat> with prayer. That's right. And so as I thought of the title for this message today, Fast Word, I'm thinking specifically about prayer. And I'm going to encourage you, if you open your bulletins, by the way, you'll notice there is a sheet that has a Sabbath hike on it and ice cream social, two weeks time, for which we hope we have weather similar to today. Turn that around. There is a blank on the back, and I'm going to encourage you. If you want to write a few things down, I'm going to share a few Bible texts as a few suggestions, ideas, that I really believe can and will be a blessing in your life. Take out a pencil, there may be one right in front of you there. And the reason I want to share this is because it's been a blessing to me. In fact, just before I came in here, I talked with one of our members, I asked him to pray for me, because I didn't want today's message to be misunderstood. It's not about me. The message is about God's grace. In, in my life. And I want to share a few testimonies only because of God's goodness. It's not about me. So I want to share with you and encourage you think about this. What, what does fast forward mean? And in the context, I believe that as we get on our knees, as we spend our time with the Lord in prayer, He will help us as a church, as a community, as a people to move forward fast or rather at the right speed that He desires us to go. I thought I want to share with you a story to begin with. Many years ago, um, I say, I began to look at what, you know, what happens when you live and you live in a place for 10 years, you accumulate lots of things. I had been collecting books and books and books. And uh, after a while, uh, it looked somewhat like this. Now, this is not the picture, but I, I, I remember it looking like that. And I thought, oh, man. So when uh, London went to Africa as missionaries, <laughs> What did we do? Ha, we took books with us. 3,000 books. Well, before we left Africa, we donated about 1,500 books, gave them to uh, folk there. We went to Peru, served there, and then left uh, another 1,500 books there. Approximate figures, because I remember coming back to the United States for just 300 out of 3,000. About a, a round figure. So, hey, okay, you know, that's a tithe for those who love numbers, right? I came back with just a few books. So, so to speak, 300. And so what I've tried over the last few years, because I know books like, whenever you move, you've got 3,000, put 20 books in, it's 150 boxes. And a lot of, uh, you know, weight, this is just heavy. And I got tired of moving things and I was glad to donate them. So whenever I'm in places, I try to avoid going to the ABC, for example. I really try that. Because I know my natural <coughs> bibliotrophy, if that's the right word, attracted to books and then I end up buying them so I try to avoid that but there was a day when we were here I'll remember it to this day it was April 21 it was the second Sunday of the Pathfinder fair I avoided going to the rack where I, I honestly did and uh, but last day and they were selling things and there was this book for 25 cents and my sweet wife decided that she'd buy it and she bought about 10 more Came up back with, spent about $2.50 for 10 books. And I'm trying to get books, remember that, don't forget. But she bought it, and that caught my attention. Years before, I had read one of Roger Morneau's books. Anybody, by the way, read or heard of Roger Morneau? No. Lots of hands going up, yes. I had a book that had just encouraged me and challenged me. So I got this 25-cent book on the 21st of April. I want to track with you now in our sharing here, just a matter of nine days. I read the book through. It's a small book. It's a little book. In fact, I brought it with me so you can see. It's not a big book. It's a tiny book, really small, and it's about 100 and something, 120 or so pages. Little book. Read it for my devotions, added to my Bible reading. 
And as I got to the end, the last chapter or so, it caught my attention and I said, wow. Because at the beginning when you read the stories, it's, it's like, this is not possible. I mean, the man, the man prays, for example, in, in one of his stories, either this book or another one, he prays for his ink cartridge, for his printer, that it won't run out because it's uh, so it, you know, like 3,000 pages to, to use or something, and he's on like page number 4,000, he doesn't have money, and the cartridge never runs out for the next 5,000 pages. So like, what? Nah, this doesn't sound real. But by the time you get to the end of the book, you're like, hmm, wait a minute, there are some incredible biblical principles that come out here. Uh, but before we go into Roger Moore knows, I thought I wanted to rather spend a few moments firstly going to Jesus, looking at his example, our sinless Savior. Open your Bibles to Luke, 5, Luke chapter 5. I'm going to give you five texts, and you can read them again at home to remind you. Today I'm using a, a special Bible called the International Children's Bible. I mentioned that I got this uh, book uh, at the Pathfinder Fair, <laughs> my wife got this book, and so I'm reading now today from the International Children's Bible, Luke 5, verse 16, called the ICB. And it's put very simply, International Children's Bible puts Luke 5, verse 16 this way, written for, I believe, a third grade level. I believe that's what they said uh, in the for the translation. But Jesus often slipped away to other places, to be alone so that he could what? So that he could pray. Right there. Let's go to the next chapter. Next chapter is chapter 6 and we want to look at verse 12. I found out that in the book of Luke we find repeatedly he refers to Jesus as a praying person. A man of prayer. Again, listen to this. When he came, chapter 5, sorry, that's chapter 6. Chapter 5, verse 12 says... Uh, 6 verse 12, thank you. At that time, Jesus went off to a mountain to pray. He stayed there all night praying to God. Chapter 6 verse 12, another verse. Chapter 9 verse 28. Let's stay in the book of Luke. We'll look at just five verses, all from that one book written by the physician, Dr. Luke. Chapter 9 verse 28. Chapter 9 verse 28. About eight days after James, after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, James, and John and went up on a mountain to pray. There it is again. Let's look at another one. Two chapters later, chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 1. Again, from the International Children's Bible. One time, Jesus was praying in a place when he finished. One of his followers said to him, John, meaning John the Baptist, taught his followers how to pray. Lord, please teach us how to pray too. Okay, and then one more verse. We go to chapter 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. We know that Jesus did teach his disciples how to pray. Obviously, it's recorded so well in Matthew chapter 6. But look at Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus used the story to teach his followers that they should always what? Always pray and never lose hope. There it is. Always pray and never lose hope. Just in that, the book of Luke alone, in those several chapters, we find repeatedly the record of Jesus as a man of prayer. Now, going back to this little book by Roger Morneau, I got to the end of the book, uh, I think it's the second last chapter or so, fourth, maybe the last, uh, chapter 13, called A Prayer Ministry. And Roger Mono then suggests, he says, do you want to have a successful prayer ministry? And by the way, those who want to jot it down, he makes five quick suggestions. I want to share them with you. Roger Mono says, you want to have a successful prayer ministry, praying for others, praying for the Lord to bless your life. Here is what you should focus on, a closer walk with Jesus. Now, that one may be obvious, but sometimes we don't realize it. Uh, a successful prayer ministry, that doesn't mean a successful prayer. Yes, there are times I shared my own experience. I, as a young man, was not walking with the Lord. And when I was in a desperate situation, you'll remember, needed to get a ride to see my mom who was ill, I prayed, Lord, please send a ride along. And you remember, I got a ride. 
The Lord does answer our prayers. We're talking about a prayer ministry where it's a, a constant, a continual uh, action where you are involved in being a blessing to others. Number two, steep yourself in Scripture. Uh, Roger Morneau says, and by the way, Roger Morneau was not a pastor, incidentally. Roger Morneau was a, a Yellow Pages salesman. Does anybody remember those days? <laughs> yellow, the Yellow Pages, this is way out of, I know, and this goes back 20, 30 years. He used to go from place to place trying to sell ads to uh, make money for the, for the Yellow Pages. <laughs> he was an active lay person, not a pastor. So I was thankful to see his emphasis, steep yourself in scripture. And Roger Morneau says what he used to do, he used to carry with him little pieces of paper. Nowadays, we don't carry pieces of paper. We carry our cell phones. We just, uh, even if you don't have it on it, you can just click on uh, and look up, uh, you know, eSword or one of those places and the Bible will pop up. But he would carry it with him so that when he has a spare moment, you're standing in line at the checkout counter. You at the DMV or the DMV you can take a number and you can stay for an hour or two you know that time to memorize scripture and Roger Morneau says that's what he did and over time the Lord blessed him he actually managed to memorize 2,200 verses of scripture and as he was sharing what happens is when he needed it those passages came back to mind and encouraged him memorizing scripture number three be motivated by compassion he doesn't uh, write a lot about this, but he just reminds us of the way Jesus was a man of compassion. Uh, his heart was always yearning. It's an interesting word there, the yearning to help people, a passionate Savior. And so this is a, step number three, be motivated. Notice, by compassion, that's by love, not by, <clears throat> I'm going to show you how to do it right, but rather by compassion. I'll be sharing with you a story in a little bit about a, a close friend of mine. And uh, the, uh, the compassion, the idea of uh, reaching out. Number four, maintain a high level of faith. A high level of faith. Just uh, this week I was chatting with uh, uh, another retired pastor I'd never met before. I didn't uh, even know he was in the area. And uh, I met him at another church and he was telling me uh, how he would uh, talk with members and say, Do you believe in God? And most of the members, they would say, Oh, yes, we do. And he said, Now I'm going to drop one word out. I'm going to drop the word in, out. What's the question now? Do you believe God? He says, there's a, and he's correct, there's a huge difference between believing in God. Well, I believe that God exists, but to believe God. And so when it gets to this matter of a prayer ministry, a high level of faith is believing that God will bring it to pass. And finally, practice a forgiving spirit to all. Roger Morneau correctly points out, if you go to the prayer of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, right after the prayer, it says, if we don't forgive others, our Heavenly Father will not forgive us. And so the idea is, if you have a forgiving spirit, you're not harboring revenge or harboring anger or bitterness. You want to have a prayer ministry, practice a forgiving spirit to all. I found those five suggestions by Morneau very, very helpful. Now remember, this is on the 21st of April when I when Linda bought the book. And by the 24th of April, I had read through this little book. It doesn't take a lot of time. Short books, small pages. And so on April 24, I put in my journal. Yes, I have been keeping a journal since the 1970s. Nowadays, it's done online. I still am writing mine uh, by hand. Uh, it takes a little uh, 10 minutes every day writing a journal. And so I uh, wrote in my journal, I'm going to start this kind of Perpetual prayer page is what I call, called it. I would keep uh, praying for the Lord about certain things, asking Him to intercede. And as some of you know, my wife and I, we had uh, left uh, Michigan. By the way, I, before I go further, staying connected, we shared this in a sermon before, that uh, without Jesus you can do nothing. Just reminding you about that when it says, have that close walk with Jesus, John 15 verse 1, and of course spending time in the Scriptures. Before we came here, we were living in Michigan, this is the inside, a picture of the house. You can find an outside picture. And um, Michigan is one of the most depressed places in the United States, as you know, because uh, that's the only state out of the 50 in the Union where the population had actually gone down over the last decade. And uh, the car business had gone down and people were leaving the state. It's very difficult to sell anything there. So we put our house for sale. And, uh, but I began to pray, Lord. That house has got to sell. We've got to get it off our uh, hands. 
Uh, this is the moving truck that had come in February. As you can see, I don't have a, house of the, a picture of the house from the outside, but as you may notice, there are, you'll see the houses around there are pretty big houses. This house is a 3,000 square foot house. We were living a half an hour outside of Lansing, and we needed the house to sell. And you know what we do, uh, we sellers do? You put the price high because you know when somebody comes, what they're going to do? Lower it. So we set the price high, expecting a buyer to come, and let's negotiate. I don't understand the mechanics of prayer. I just knew. I said, Lord, and I began to pray earnestly. We've got to get this off our hands. We're here trying to settle in. Please, Father. Now, this is in April. I was praying on the 24th, 25th. And uh, the, 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 we'd heard that there was a possibility of uh, somebody buying it. And by the 25th, uh, our, uh, our realtor contacted said, listen, I think there's a check coming your way. Wow, really? And I, I waited. At the 26th, there was a check that was in the bank. And long story short, uh, the man went and just paid the whole price. He didn't uh, negotiate. So, well, thank you, Lord, for that extra. That was a wonderful blessing. And uh, just to thank you for answering that prayer. And as time went on, a few days later, I was going to go and run the Eugene Marathon to here with our Pathfinders and uh, 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 Dr. Micaiah Kuzma joined me and I hadn't had the time to prepare for it as I should have and I prayed I said Lord I need to do this successfully for our pathfinders because I found out a few days before that a quarter of the money that was being pledged was if I ran fast oh, I said okay Lord you've got to have to help me to succeed here because I had put out a challenge to my, my church, those of you who are visitors here if I qualify for Boston, not that I'm going to run Boston, but just to qualify for it would you double the uh, uh, pledges and one of the members who sits right here he had said to me a few weeks before are you going to qualify for Boston I said no he said good I said what do you mean he said I, I, I'll double my money if you do well of course I began to pray Lord help me to do it and the Lord did <laughs> and uh, friend but he, he has doubled the pledges again the Lord's answer I, it was a it was miraculous that and again thanks to Dr. Mike Kuzma, he said he would join me at mile 20 to run with me the last six miles. He joined me at mile 18. And I was so glad he was with me for eight miles instead of six. He helped me through it and answered to prayer. Another prayer I began to pray uh, very fervently was about this young man. I say, well, we had been friends for many, many years. I met him in the 19, late 1960s. In the 1990s, he turned away from our advent of faith. Then he gave, he gave up Christianity. He became an atheist in the 1990s, about uh, 20 years ago. And I began to pray for him intermittently. I prayed for him, and we stayed friends. Every time I had a chance, I'd stop by and visit him. In December last year, you'll notice it says December 14 on the picture there, I was in South Africa, Cape Town, to speak for a youth event there, a training event. And uh, I was driving from Cape Town up to Johannesburg. Johannesburg is north. That's where most of the are and so forth, uh, rather gold mines. And so he was driving from Johannesburg down to Cape Town. And uh, we called each other on the cell phone and we realized we were on the same road going the opposite direction. Well, because we're good friends and uh, uh, we managed to find each other at a, at a town in the middle, at a town called Lanesburg. I waited for him and we stopped there. We visited together and had a great visit. This is uh, Cliff and his uh, uh, daughter there at this uh, uh, kind of a a little town where there was a, like a truck stop and other places we stopped and had a bite to eat. By the way, just so you do know, I did contact Cliff this week. I wrote this thing on August 29, Sarah's birthday, right? Hi, Cliff. I'm preaching on Sabbath on answers to prayer. You are such a wonderful answer to the prayers of many. How would you feel if an abbreviated account of how God answered our prayers on your behalf? I'd even show pictures of you. And baptism. Let me know. Thanks. Same day he wrote back, Hi Ron, I pray that the Holy Spirit will use your sermon to encourage many and also to teach the vital importance of real communication with God. I am very, very grateful that prayers on my behalf were answered and that I was brought to see and accept the real issues in life and the universe. By the way, he uh, was a science major, okay? <laughs> uh, if the story of prayer on my behalf will be of value in your sermon, then by all means do whatever you are say and show. And I thank God for it. God bless you and Linda Gill to pray in your ministry. August 29, 10.07 p.m. I wanted you to know that I'm sharing a story about him with permission. He uh, 
He left not just, as I said, Adventism. He left Christianity, became an atheist, and uh, lived uh, like an atheist. Just uh, not with God for many, many years. And it was around the 24th, as I said, I began to pray for him day in and day out that the Lord would work on his heart. In uh, March this year, on a prearranged uh, uh, appointment before I joined the Oregon Conference, I had been asked to speak in for camp meeting in April, Easter time. So I went to South Africa to speak. And uh, while I was there, I contacted him and uh, uh, saw him, got to talk with him, and slowly began to see that he was heaven-bound. And I chatted with him one day, and, I, and he said, yes, yes, guess what? I, have, uh, I believe in the Sabbath. Number two, I believe in the second coming of Jesus. Hmm, wait a minute. Sabbath, which day is that? Seventh day? Second coming of Jesus is what? The Advent. Seventh-day Adventist? He said, but I'm not going to become an Adventist. Absolutely not. Don't, no way. He said, Adventist, uh, if you are an Adventist, my apologies here today. I know many of you are, most of you. He said, Adventists are weak. I'm a Christian. I believe in the Sabbath, and I believe in the second coming of Jesus. Oh, oh, I also believe in Ellen White, but I'm not going to become an Adventist. On the 24th, I wrote in my little book. I put it in my book. I brought my book with me today. I have my prayer list in my little black book here, my date book, and I wrote in there, and I'm going to start praying for, for, Steve, for, for, uh, for, for Cliff. Here it is. Uh, Cliff Peterson, commitment, job, friends, SDA. I added number four, SDA. I said, Lord, <laughs> uh, my friend Cliff says Adventists are weird. I'm not. He uh, doesn't come back to us weird folk. Please, Father, work on him. And so, uh, again, summarizing the long story, when we were done with the marathon, we were sitting at lunch. The Pathfinders wanted to go out to eat. I think it was Olive Garden we went to eat that day. And as we were sitting there, waiting for the food to come, I got a, I got a, a Facebook message. And it was from Cliff. He said, this is April 28th. I started to frame very seriously on April 24th. April 28th, folks, I have decided to be baptized this coming Sabbath. So, whoa, wait a minute, that's six days' time. I, and so Linda and I did, we called him up. He said, wait a minute, Clough, I thought you said Adventists are weird. <laughs> In fact, he put the post up. On Sabbath morning, he put this post up, Cliff Peterson, May 4, this year, via email upload. Today is the most important day of my life. I, I said to him on the phone, I called him. By the way, Saturday, Friday night here, 10 o'clock, is 7 a.m. there in Cape Town, okay, just so you know. So Friday night, 10 o'clock, got on the phone, called him up. Just so you know, we've been friends, best friends for about 40 years. All right, called him up, I said, Cliff, exciting news, praise the Lord. But I have to talk with you. Did you not say that Adventists are weird and you're not going to join us? He said, I said it and I still believe it. <laughs> but, he added, I am getting baptized today. So praise the Lord. Oh, uh, doesn't matter if Adventists are weird, I want to join them. And, and I was amazed at the way the Lord is leading within five days of me getting very, very serious about commitment and praying daily for the Lord. And I want to show you a few pictures. This is Cliff. This is him with his mom and his uh, uh, second oldest son. Day of his baptism. This is outside of the church. Uh, the gentleman on the far right, by the way, is a cousin of mine. Very close cousin. We went uh, through theology together. And uh, this is Cliff before the baptism, I believe, and now in the baptismal tank uh, to be baptized. And he called this the most important day of my life. And I'm, I'm sitting and thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing the way the Lord has been answering prayers. You know, the house got sold. My buddy made it, the turned around, came back to the Lord, was able to uh, do well at the, at the marathon. Over and over the Lord is blessing. Of course, it's, uh, I want to go back to this passage in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Specifically thinking of my best friend. Read it with me. Are you ready? The goodness of God leads you to repentance. So really, it's all about God's grace blessed how he has showered it on and i was worried about my friend i was praying for him this week 
Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I knew I wanted to preach about him. And he has disappeared from Facebook for about two or three weeks. And I thought, where has Cliff gone? So when I sent the, when he suddenly showed up, I was just thinking about him, praying about him this week. Suddenly he posted something on Facebook. And I said, where did you get that? And he wrote where he got this beautiful statement about God's grace, etc. And uh, then, he, then I said to him, can I use your story today to tell folk about how God has answered? By the way, it wasn't just my prayers. It was his mom who was praying. It was others who were praying. In fact, one of our mutual friends, he was a pastor. One day he dreamt about Cliff. And after his dream, he called Cliff up and he said, hey, Cliff, I dreamed about you. What did you dream about me, Cliff said. This is about 10 years ago. I dreamed that you had come back to the Lord. <laughs> the pastor just called him up and told him, I dreamed about you. And I remember sitting at the table with Cliff that day with his mom and, uh, and family <clears throat> several years ago. And Cliff said, Ron, when I come back, that I said, did you just say when? <laughs> he did say when, but it took him years. And, and I wonder, I wonder about me. Am I praying enough? for others. I, I'm just challenging sharing with you the experience how the Lord has blessed. It has awoken me to the importance of people. Now, the, the friend I'm, I was telling you about, we were friends for 40 something years. And I, I'll be honest, when he left the faith, it was like death in the family. It was worse than a death in the family. I, I remember going through tremendous turmoil and, and telling a nephew, my, my wife's nephew, he said, what's wrong, Uncle Ron? What's wrong? Did someone die? I said, Danny, worse than death. What? Worse than death? Danny's own dad died in an accident. And I said, yes, a friend of mine just turned his back on Jesus. And so I prayed for my friend, Cliff, but I, 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 I just wasn't as committed in praying. And the Lord has taught an important lesson, brothers and sisters. I'm almost, well, I am embarrassed to say that it took me a while to realize I got to get much more serious about praying. As I read Roger Morneau's book, and I God, God works through lay people as well. God doesn't just work through pastors. God works mostly, I believe, through lay people because the, the most of the church is made by lay people. I thank God for a lay person like Roger Morneau that reminded me of getting serious about praying. And as I got serious about praying, the Lord blessed and kept blessing me. April 21, we're on April 28. So many things were happening. By April 28, my best buddy had turned around, given his life the Lord that was on Sunday and on Sabbath he was baptized but one more amazing gift amazing answer to prayer came to me to my wife on Monday one more answer to prayer or in October last year almost a year ago I was on my way to church one Sabbath long journey to two and a half hours to get to church that Sabbath and about 15 minutes before I got to church suddenly as I was uh, driving I couldn't pull away in first gear. I was on a little incline at the stop sign. Huh, what's that? Why won't my car move? Well, it turned out that my gears had just died on me. I had been to the mechanic two or three times and I told him there was a rattle that I was concerned about. He said, ah, it's nothing, just a loose heat shield. Lifted the car up, checked it underneath, took a heat shield off. There I went back, I said, that rattle is still there. He said, oh, it's another loose heat shield. It wasn't heat shield, it was my gears backing up. So my car died in, in October last year. So when we moved here in January, we had only one car. I said, Lord, you've, you've got to, you were able to sell our house better than we had ever dreamed. I need a second car so that Linda can use her car. I was borrowing this car. I need a car, Lord. This is now the house payment came through on the 26th on that Friday. On Monday, I went online to look for some cars. And Monday, we drove down to this uh, dealer down in town, O'Brien's, I believe it is, and started looking around at cars and uh, found a car that cost literally, listen carefully, tens of thousands of dollars less than my wife's Honda. Wow! And the Lord blessed another answer to prayer. And I know people say, what? Yes, that's what I got for tens of thousands of dollars less than my wife's Honda. And I say, wow, Lord. He, the Lord basically threw the car in my lap. And so people look at the car and they say, whoa, nice Mercedes, 112,000 miles on it, a 1999 model. Again, another answer to prayer. God has answered the prayers so many times over the last few months. I have just given you nine days of God's astounding answers. 
And that very day, April 29, I was able to go out and do my first visitation. And I've had the privilege of visiting, visiting all the way until last week. This week, as you know, was the Oregon State Fair. So I've been down there, and instead of visiting, people have been coming to visit me. <laughs> and we're very of you have had the chance to be out there and to share actively involved. One more important thing in reason about prayer we've not talked about as we start wrapping up here. The armor of God. Faith versus the fiery darts. We've talked about this before. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. I want you to go with me now to verse 18. Let's go to verse 18. Ephesians chapter 6. We often talk about resisting the devil and he will flee from you. Yes, but how? What is a very important aspect here of being able to resist the fiery darts? Ephesians chapter... Again, reading from this version, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, from the International Children's Bible. It says, pray in the Spirit at all times. Pray with all kinds of prayer and ask for everything you need. I love that. Everything you need, not everything you want. To do this, you must always be ready. Never give up. Always pray for all God's people. Very simply, very directly, calling us right there after the fiery darts to pray at all times. It's a beautiful statement that uh, one of the members of our church shared just this week with me from Acts of the Apostles, that's the AA at the bottom, page 564, paragraph 1. Prayer is heaven's ordained means of success in the conflict with sin. We just read Ephesians chapter 6. And the development of Christian character. The divine influences that come in answer to the prayer of faith will accomplish in the soul of the suppliant all for which he pleads. For the pardon of sin, for the Holy Spirit, for a Christ-like temper, for wisdom and strength to do his work. For any gift he has promised, we may ask. And the promise is what? Ye shall receive. Don't you love that? Oh, it's such a beautiful uh, uh, promise there. I'm going to share with you briefly here. People say, but, but uh, how do we pray? I've summarized here what I call the seven important aspects of praying. Those who want to write it down, each one of these, and by the way, the word praying has seven letters because people say, oh, my prayers get a little weary. It's the same thing every day. I have practiced this and uh, 80, 90 percent, 80 percent of this comes directly from Jesus' prayer. Um, petition. So what I did uh, and I've done in the past is uh, Sundays to focus on petition. Petition is simply prayer for your own needs. Petition, praying that uh, that will happen. Now, you can pray for anything, but I'm giving suggestions on seven days. And I find out that varying the prayers of the week has been a great blessing in my own spiritual life. Then on Monday, I focus on repentance. Repentance, heartfelt turning to God. And I, I focus about on that and I think about uh, what the Lord is calling me to do to repent on. It's the Holy Spirit who works on us and who calls us to repentance. But this is the day I try to focus. I've done this. I'm not doing this uh, series right now, but I've done this in the past and it's been such a blessing uh, praying and I wanted to share this with you today. Number three, the A. Adoration. Simply praising God for His goodness. The book of Revelation is full of that. Praise be to God, uh, who's, and then blessing and power and honor and glory and goodness to Him. Just praising Him for His goodness. I remember attending a church some years ago when uh, one of the associate pastors would there. He had, it wasn't a flowery speech, but it was a wonderful prayer that blessed us as he praised God for his goodness. When his prayer was over, three minutes, you felt so blessed. I remember times thinking, I can go home now. I was ready. I'd been so blessed by a wonderful prayer, uh, focusing on adoration. The why, middle of the week on Wednesday, yielding. And this is so important. Central in the whole praying is that total submission to God's will. I know, I'm sure you can resonate with me. We human beings, we are, we, I'm, I talk about myself. 
but I, I, I've been around long enough to know we are so similar. We want our will, okay? Lord, I want to do your will, but I want to do it my way. You know what I'm talking about? That's the way we are. At least that's the way I am, okay? Just uh, this is the challenge we have. And so to yield total submission to God's will is sometimes, well, no, is all the time a challenge, <laughs> right? We're human beings. Our hearts are still struggling. Uh, Jeremiah says, uh, desperately wicked. The I, intercession. Thursday is the day I would focus on praying for others and their needs. Now notice the difference I'm making between petition, praying for my own needs, and intercession, praying for others' needs. So I'm suggesting this is another thing to, to challenge you just to make your prayer life a little more varied. And as you go to the prayer of Jesus in Matthew 6, you can read the prayer and you'll find that almost everything that I'm sharing comes out of that prayer of Matthew chapter 6. The end, praying in the name of Jesus recognize we need Jesus. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, chapter 6, Jesus doesn't say pray in my name. You find it in other places. Everything that you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So praying in the name of Jesus. And finally, on Sabbath mornings, it's, it's exciting. Even this did that again. Sabbath morning, gratitude. I find it exciting on Sabbath morning when I'm having my morning prayer devotion. I think about the whole week. And I started last Sabbath. Last after, after, uh, after church, I had the chance to go and have lunch with a family where there were several who are here today. We had lunch together. I was thinking of the lunch we had. Wonderful fellowship time together. And so I went through the whole week, Sabbath, what happened Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And I tracked through the week, what am I grateful for? And I spent a few minutes thinking about God's blessings. And as you do these things, it broadens your prayer life. I'm suggesting this to you today as in one of the ways to just, remember, the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. As I said, most of this comes directly as a summary, as an acronym of that special prayer by Jesus. Just a suggestion for what you can do to, to uh, your prayer, your prayer life. I love the way Psalm 91 says that. We often think about that in uh, of being safe in God's hands, but I love the four words. Before that, notice it says, He shall call upon me and what? I will answer him. I will answer him. And the question comes, why don't we have the answers to our prayers? Now, obviously, there can be many answers to that question. But I love the way James 4 verse 2, the last part, the NIV, right there in your pew Bible, puts it this way. You do not have what? Because you do not have. Ask God. And, and I thought, well stated. You do not have before because you do not ask God. The New Jerusalem Bible has put it this way. It is because you do not pray that you do not receive. I was thinking about that and I wanted to encourage you and challenge you. Because today as I shared the experiences within those nine days from April 21 to April 29, once I got this book, 25 cent book and I began to get serious about praying I began to see the way the Lord answered miraculously the prayers the most exciting one was the one I showed you most pictures of how God brought my buddy Cliff back to the faith back to us weird people okay he says I don't want to join Adventists because Adventists are weird but he came back and I just thank God for that his wonderful grace Notice the way the New Living Translation puts it more paraphrastically. The reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. So that was fascinating. There it is. Different translations giving the same idea, just reminding us, you don't have because you don't ask God. I saw this one on the internet. It's a little fuzzy, but I'm going to read it to you. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. The faithful see the invincible, believe the incredible, and then receive the impossible. Isn't that wonderful? Love it. And this is because in answer to prayer, when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. The faithful see the invincible, believe the incredible, and then receive the impossible. I have one more text I want to share with you as we close today. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to one last passage. Habakkuk chapter 1. Verse 5, in the context of the message today, urging you, challenging you, urging me, reminding myself, we need to ask more. We need to speak in faith. We need to trust the Lord. Step forward by faith. Now, I know the context is 
Habakkuk is a prophet. He's writing to God's people thousands of years ago. But I love the way verse 5 has put it. Verse 5 is a challenge to me, is a challenge to you. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 5. Take just the main concept there from this passage. You and your people, look at the nations, God says. Watch them and be amazed. Now notice the last part of this verse. I, God says, will do something in your lifetime that will amaze you. You won't believe it even when you are told about it. I thought that was fascinating. It's true. As you and I, brothers and sisters, spend time on our knees, spend time where we are, praying for God to intervene in the lives of people. The reason I share the story of my buddy Cliff, it's got nothing to do with me. I'm so thankful the Lord reminded me to start praying. And others were praying for my buddy Cliff. His mother was praying, his family, his friends were praying for him. I want to urge you, I want to challenge you. God has a lot of great things in store for you, in store for me, if we are willing to spend time in His presence, spend time praying. Today I'm going to invite you to join me and sing. I'm going to ask Mark and Mike to come and join me as well. We're going to lead you in singing this uh, beautiful hymn, the well-known one, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Because the song talks about prayer, it's an old song, but the words are so beautiful. I know sometimes, which is what I like about new songs, they make us think about the words. Old songs, we forget about the words. Isn't that true? We don't think about it. But so today, it's an old song, but I want to urge you, open your hymnal, think about the words as we sing this together. We're going to invite you to stand with us. Think about those words. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Think about it. Sing it with your heart. May God bless you. He'll take and 
Lord for reminding us that no matter what the challenge is, no matter what the issue is, we can always take it to you in prayer. Lord, thank you for reminding me through the book by a lay person who loved you, a person who prayed fervently. Thank you for Roger Morneau's book. Mostly thank you for Jesus and his prayer life. As we look at the life of our Lord, we realize that he prayed constantly, consistently, compassionately. And so today, as you've reminded us, just through these nine days of my own experience, how you blessed materially, physically, spiritually, thank you again, Lord, for being so gracious to us. We know you have lots of wonderful blessings in store for us, and we know that we do not receive because we do not ask. And so, Lord, we pray that you will help us, help us to have more faith in you, to have a closer walk with Jesus, to be steeped in the scriptures, to have a forgiving spirit, to have compassion on others, to have a ministry of prayer for which we will see results in your kingdom. Help us to walk joyfully on our journey with Jesus. In his name, let God's people say, Amen.